Why, hello there, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages. My name is Dogwood333, and welcome to Hearts of Iron for the newer last days of Europe. Now, last time we hopped into some good old TNO, it was as call me, fucking again. But instead of doing some unbelievably cursed, depressing stuff, we had a bit of a more fun time. We hopped in as Andrei Zidanov overtook the Komi Communist Party, and and uh, went ahead and implemented ultra-visionary socialism. Luxury, gay, space communism without the luxury and the gay part. Uh, basically a bunch of batshit crazy scientific experiments, but we got a fellow by the name of Kardashev in power after Zidanov died to have a fun old time and hopefully produce something better in the future. Now... It's time to move on, as always, because TNO in time stops for no man. So let's get working on another one. So you can see our last little save right there. We're going to be hopping into another Russian warlord, and I was actually teasing this on my uh, community page. I asked you guys for a poll to decide what nation I was going to play next. And you all pretty much went ahead and agreed on... Let's see, where are they? Where... Where's the flag? There we are. Sverdlovsk. Marshal Konstantin Rokozovsky and his third army def defended the Soviet Union from fascist invaders until there was no longer a union to defend. Bloody but not defeated, Rokozovsky drifted eastwards where he found himself part of the Western Siberian People's Republic. However, seeing the corruption, incompetence, and Competence and callousness for public leadership, Rokozovsky quickly became disillusioned. When the opportunity arose, he broke away and declared a rival military government in Sverdlovsk, seeing much of the Republic's northern territories along with it. Now Sverdlovsk stands alone against the approaching storm, the bear of, of the shining of liberty in a land of oppression and, and death. Rokozovsky, as old as he is, remains steadfast in his desire to reunite the motherland, with the military at the helm, serving the worker and peasant. Above the bureaucrat, aristocrat, or apparatchik. Well, there we go. So, let's go ahead and select them. Sverdlovsk. Uh, people in the early game might remember them as the only person who would re uh, reunify this, uh, this area of Russia. And now you might recognize them as the guys who get beat by fucking Yugra, of all fucking nations. But, uh... I have a feeling that we're going to do a little bit better. So here's to hoping that happens. Now is there anything we want to do to mess around? I don't think so. We'll just go ahead and start the game. Any second now? You got a game, you can do it. You can do it. You got this game. Come on. It's it's okay. It's okay. So how are you guys doing? Um, this is a uh fun series. This is the first series. That I've started to record in my 20s. I am, uh. I turned 20, what was that? Four days ago? At the time of recording this, so that's pretty nice. So, uh, I'm 20 now, I also graduated. I now have three associate degrees, so that's, that's kind of neat. I don't have them yet, uh, they're, they mailed to me. Uh, the semester officially ended today, I guess. Today or yesterday? It ended yesterday for me because that was the last time I had homework. And so I'm ready to just go ahead and start recording some content on mass. And this is going to be the first in this new era of dog boat content. So hopefully this lives up to you guys' expectations and we all have fun together. So let's go ahead and uh, get her started with the Ural Military District. As a great patriotic war was lost and the Union collapsed, the valiant soldiers of the Soviet Third Army, Army fled to the Urals to regroup. There they found an ally of circumstance in the irrelevant apparatchik, Lazar Moiseevich Kaganovic, 
who proclaimed the West Siberian People's Republic with their support. As the terror bombings began and the Republic spiraled into disarray, the Third Army's leader took it upon himself to protect the Russian people from all manners of tyranny. That man was Marshal Konstantin Konstantinovich Rokozovsky, who rallied his forces and proclaimed a provisional government in the city of Sverdlovsk. Sverdlovsk lacks any defining ideological characteristics. Instead, it remains a fairly benevolent military dictatorship ruled by Rokozovsky and his officer comrades. The military is a formidable force. Commanded by Pavel Ivanovich Batov, it consists of the Third Army and a significant number of auxiliary units raised from the population of Sverdlovsk. Also employs some of the most skilled generals in all of Russia. Control of the city of Sverdlovsk provides the district with access to a sizable industrial base, which in turn has created a stable and relatively higher quality of life than most other warlords. Despite all of this, Sverdlovsk's internal situation is shaky. A great deal of the citizenry is at least sympathetic to Tiamin, having only defected involuntarily when the Third Army garrisons turned on their doorstep. As a result, spies and saboteurs own allegiance to Gaganvik run rampant. Desertions are a consistent problem. The military, much of which has been conscripted, faces a similar problem with the added threat of the Black League, Black League infiltration. Externally, the West situation is just as perilous. To the South, Tiamin plots the return of a West Siberian People's Republic in the black city of Omsk stirs in preparation for the coming conflict. In the north, the motivation of the abandoned state of Ugra and the NKVD holdouts in Vorkuta are unknown, but for now they pose little threat. Sverdlovsk's trusted allies in the northeast with free aviators stand with the marshal, as the mer and the Merchant Republic of Zatost is always willing to do business with the Third Army. For a price, of course. Rokozovsky grows older and weaker by the day, yet his resolve remains unshakable. He is certain that, even if he does not complete his mission, his comrades in arms will. He has to really judge whether or not the old marshal is right. So, our features. We can purge the Red Army of unsavory elements or face the consequences. We can continue the military government or establish a semi-functional democracy. Or we can serve the people, and we can serve the people of Russia and reunite the fractured motherland. To serve Russia. So! Let's check out our little focuses. First is Luftwaffe terror bombings. That's the same for anyone in West Russia and West Siberia. So nothing new or crazy there. We have the not-so-red army. In spite of being led by Marshal Rokozovsky, our red army begins to show lack signs of faltering in purpose. Where is a Black League infiltration, revisionist sympathies reach the Marshal's ears more and more. The last tenets of communism haven't been cast aside in favor of regular military leadership. The task of figuring out a unifying direction will probably fall on the Marshal's successor, Albert. The old lion cannot fight off, off death forever. Next, we have low league influence. Through careful inspection and constant vigilance, the, the, the influence of the Black League within the district has been largely curtailed. Though some minor infiltrators have been uncovered, they are of limited influence and in no way threaten any of the integrated governmental or military organs relied upon for continuity. Next, we have me medium revisionary influence. Okay. A concerning degree of revisionist sympathies has been uncovered among a number of junior officials. Though not yet at a point where fundamental aspects of the district's administration would be at threat, it l has led to the compromise of several low-level facilities and operations and should therefore be presently addressed. So, along with that, we have Konstantin Rokozevsky, the Lion of Siberia, which gives us a nice bonus to Army Experience game. That is beautiful, honestly. Unlike many other men, Konstantin Konstantinovich Rokozovsky stayed faithful to the Soviet motherland, no matter, no matter what, even to this day. Being born in the days of the Tsar to a family of Polish gentry, he had to suffer a very poor life as a child. It's only logical that he turned to the Bolshevik party and soon became one of the most distinguished and well-known commanders of the Soviet Union, a distinguished gentleman and officer whose military record was nothing short of brilliant. After two decades of serving the Red Army, the House of Cards would crumble, the USSR would collapse, and Rokozovsky would have to adapt to a completely new environment. As his Third Army fled from the invading Germans and reached the Urals, he was welcomed with open arms by Lazar Kaganovic, and so he joined the West Siberian People's Republic. However, the alliance of Kaganovic and his generals, full of distrust and middle competition, was a fragile one, and would inevitably fall apart. Western Siberia would battle for its survival against all odds as the Germans continued their relentless bombing raids and rifts between its top leaders and generals only grew and grew to a point where they could not be mended. 
Seeing the People's Republic was a sinking ship as Karpyshev seized the city of Omsk and Kaganvek showed its disdain by his inaction. Borkozovsky would quickly gather his third army of cities for Lolsk to form a provisional military government led by himself and backed by a formidable force. While disillusioned with his former party's superiors and team, and Rokozovsky has not abandoned his cause of the Soviet Union reunification, even it will be driven by its loyalty and impartial military, born and taught in the best traditions of the Soviet and Russian style of war, and serving the working people above the bureaucrats. The harsh service in old age took a considerable toll on Rokozovsky's health, but his resolve remains persistent in the desperate times. Even if he won't live to see the Red Army marching in the Red Square once again, he can rely on the old friend and comrades to continue his mission with dignity. Not bad at all. So we got Batov, a respected war hero, as our head of government. We also have Anatoly Dobrynian as our foreign minister. Farman Samanov as our uh, our eco economic minister. And Ivan Bagramian as our security minister. All solid boosts altogether. So I think I'll take that. So, our starting focus is going to be a bastion of freedom. Russia is broken. It was shattered without mercy by Nazi firepower even then, in the afterglow of her victory. Nazi planes scream and rattle overhead, sneering at us while they destroy our cities and murder our children, but it was also torn apart from within by traitors, collaborators, men without loyalty or principles. Men who have only to sate their lust for power and blood. Our motherland was destroyed, and from deep within those abyssal fractures, evil and tyranny poured forth, sweeping away what little we, we had left. Sverlovsk stands as a bulwark against this black tide, a candle in the dark, the last bash in freedom. We shall fight with every drop of blood in our bodies to preserve our freedoms. There we go, base stability. So we'll go ahead... Field Marshal, we'll get Rokozovsky. And for a general, we'll get Mr. Batov. We have some free civilian factories. We'll use it to build more civilian factories. We'll get... We'll do the usual start, some research, and then some industry civilian construction. Sounds pretty good right about now. Let's see, do we have any unique mechanics yet? Does not seem to be so. So, let me go ahead and get my timer ready. And as soon as we unpause, we'll start the timer. Go! That wasn't right as soon as we started, but close enough. I will take that. Here's so the free aviators get the they do not get the uh, bombing. That's interesting. I figured they wouldn't. Do we get it as bad as these guys? We have a less bad version. That's interesting. Okay. That that makes perfect sense. I guess I ne I never took a time to look over and consider it, but that's interesting. <coughs> interesting story if nothing else. That's nice, dear. <clears throat> Pavel put the sealed envelope aside and reached for the stack of reports on his desk. He pulled one from the top and carefully read it over. Maxim Pavlovich Karchagin, born 302-1934, 214th Battalion, 52nd Regiment, 139th Rifle Division, KIA in a skirmish south of kamensk Orelsky. He flipped the report over and sighed sadly. Married. Two children, both four years old. Drawing his pen from his ink well, he plucked a piece of paper from the stationery and began to write. <clears throat> Please accept my dearest, most genuine sympathy on the loss of your husband. Another letter, another tragedy. Nothing could he could write would ease her pain. How could words describe the indescribable? The sorrow, the fear, the anger. Maxime died for no reason, killed by a faceless enemy, and reduced to a name and photograph on a piece of paper. But he was so much more than that. A soldier, a lover, a husband, a father. Now, just a corpse. How many would die? 
before Russia was reunited. How many more letters would have to be written? The thought made Pavel's insides turn. Maxim was a hero to not only the soldiers with whom he served, but all of Russia. I wish you and your family the very best as you deal with this unthinkable tragedy. If there's anything I can do to ease your pain, I welcome the opportunity. Pavel folded up the letter and slid it inside an envelope, sealing it with a wax stamp. He put the envelope aside and reached for a stack of reports on his desk. With deepest sympathy, Pavel Ivanovich Batov. Oh. We'll go ahead and get two guys training at a time. It looks like we're missing artillery and support. Why are we building so many rifles at the same time? Anti tank, support equipment, I think it's said. And artillery. Well, let's get the artillery going then. There we go! Strange how that was set up, but I'm not gonna. I'll question it, but it doesn't matter too much. Hashbeer! Interesting. A bastion of freedom. Now let's look around you. Look around you, fellow Russians. Tell me, what do you see? Do you see the devastation, the sickness, the death, the anarchy, the course of death that rings from Archangels to Kamchatka? Do you hear the cracking of hooves on stone and the great horns lauding the horseman's approach? Do you see the madness just beyond our borders? What if the north, where the world of a petty criminal's law, would have to human whose leaders are slaves to terror, and Omsk, whose leadership would have the millions slaughtered in the blink of an eye in the name of revenge? If you do, my fellow Russians, then you see why we must preserve our freedom. <clears throat> Squint appeared to the bottom of a cast iron pot to the muddy soup that coated its innards. Veins stuck to its form like pearls among the choppy sea. Squint had to admit that it was not very nutritious nor filling, but food was food. He lifted his gaze to the line of men, women, and children who awaited their daily rations of bread and soup. He sighed. It was probably not enough either. Squint looked at the metal platter beside him, the few crumbs blurring with a dull, slate-covered surface. Besides him stood Squeaker, the recruit whose rifle was unslung. Occasionally the private had to yell in a high-pitched squeal to keep the crowd in order. Without that rifle, the men and women in that line would have laughed at Squeaker's voice. Hey, you need some help? You want to swap, new guy? No. I'm fine. I, I can do this. The kid got dropped into a squad full of mean-faced veterans and was trying to sound like he belonged there. All the others didn't like him much, but Squint saw some grit in the squeaker's demeanor. A desire to live above and beyond the call. Give him time, Squint said to Baker. Give him time. If you say so. Squint wasn't much either at the start. He could hardly see, hence the nickname Squint. His breath fogged up his barely fitting prescription glasses, and as he took them down to clean them, he heard a whir and roar overpowering the den of the crowd. Germans! Duck! Duck! Wasting no time, Squint dropped his spectacles and lay still, his heart beating the cavity of his chest down, buzzing and then silence. It took a good few minutes before the procession could continue. Just another morning in the military district. So what do we got? We got war planning, all this stuff. I think we're good so far. Um, off them is helping out. Ooh! To the other patrons of the bar, the three men were unremarkable, impossible to pick out in a crowd. They were banking on that, after all. Boris Yeltsin, Yevgeny Primakov, and Alexander Tizyakov seated themselves in a booth, ordered their drinks, and got to talking. <clears throat> we have to be bolder. I've been to the protest. There are thousands of people in the city who believe change is possible, that democracy is possible. We have to spread the word that this government does not represent them. True liberty gives the people ballots, not bullets. And to do that, we need to push more newspapers and hold more rallies. Two of his associates stumbled over one another, trying to respond first. Two of my guys were jailed last week for disturbing, distributing provocative literature, Yevgeny said. If we start promoting what's effectively treason, they might shut us down for good. And that means I'll go to prison, too. Think about our expenses, Boya, Alexander said. Newspapers and flyers are expensive. 
Rallies are even more expensive. We can't keep pulling money from my contacts without Rokozewski noticing. Then he follows the paper trailing. I get it! I get it, Boris said, waving his arms to spell the conversation as if it were cigar cigarette smoke. Of course we have to be careful, but we have to push the envelope here. We have a real shot at building democracy in Russia. We can't squander it. The waiter arrived with their drink shortly after. Boris raised a small glass of whiskey and smirked at his co-conspirators. A toast to freedom. 5% boost to conserve democracy. And Boris Yeltsin has become the leader of the conservative democracy party. Let's get a look at that little sliver. The LPR. Okay. Old Boris is uh, coming in. So we got two states. Not bad population. Sverdlovsk. Konsky Manziki is a little bit underwhelming, but what are you going to do there? <clears throat> we got the not so red army. Private Dmitry Sergeyevich Chernov chewed the tasteless cafeteria meat. He'd been scripted conscripted several years ago and could still remember the Third Army's revolution against Tiumen. What he couldn't remember was a day since then when his food had had any flavor. He turned to his friend Private Morozov, who hadn't been in, in the army as long as he had. Do you think that this isn't really what socialism is like? I mean, they told us that after the revolution everyone would be free, but since then we've been eating the same crap and being yelled at by the same officers like before. Morozov smiled as he lit a cigarette. Mr. Gavik, I gave up on those foreign lies a long time ago. A few months ago, I started reading this pamphlet Alexovic gave me. It told me about the true path to avenge those who tortured the motherland. The path to prosperity all Russians would enjoy once we vanquished those enemies who had wronged her. Can I see the thing? Just, uh, just curious, asked Chernov. Morozov took a small battered pamphlet out of his coat pocket. The Black League, the rebirth of Russia, several letters at the top. The Black Sheik's League's shadow lengthens. Anyway, what was I about to say? I feel like I was saying something. So I did something in... The, I, I announced this on the community tab. It was between this and Wholesome Reddit Karma over here. Uh, Buryatia. And you guys picked Sverdlovsk. And I did a little bit of a different poll as well. I asked... Because there are two different paths. I won't quite announce them yet. But there are two different paths. And, um... I made sure to be very, very unhelpful with the subsequent announcements describing what was next. Because I've come to a decision on which uh, path I'm going to be taking. But I won't tell you guys that yet. We'll uh, wait for that. For now, it's time for liberty and death. Nadia heaved the pot of water into the stove and twisted the burner onto its high settings. That's when she heard it. It was a voice flowing in through the open window next to her. A stray gust of wind filled the curtains. She pushed past them and stuck her head out the window. Her senses burst with detail. A loud crowd squirmed around the Sverdlovsk statue on the street below, spilling over onto the road. The voice belonged to a middle-aged man, standing on a small wooden platform in the center of the crowd. Between the mumbling of the crowd and the horn honking on the horns and the hiss of the water on the stove, she couldn't make out every word of what the man was saying, but she heard his voice. He was emphatic, booming, passionate. He spoke of liberty and how Rokozovsky had robbed them of it. He paused and the crowd cheered. She did too. Democracy. What an incredible idea. Two black trucks screeched to a halt in the roundabout, their blue and white lights flashing. The back doors opened and black-clad figures poured out. Nadia's insides twisted. Her fingers gripped the sill. A second voice cut in, amplified by a loudspeaker. It snarled, demanding that the crowd disperse. Their response, calling him a fascist, a tyrant, a Hitlerite, drowned out his demands. The middle-aged man was gone. A few of the black figures lobbed smoked, smoking canisters into the crowd. The front of the crowd recoiled backwards. Gunshots. The men in the back surging forward, screaming. Nadia stepped back from the window. She was shaking. Her hand struck the side of the pot and slid off the stove, spilling boiling water into her leg and clattering on the floor. She cried out. A string of profanity slipped through her teeth as a wave of pain swept over her, making her feel dizzy. 
The unmistakable sounds of truncheons and flesh, interspersed with gunshots, filled the streets below, the sounds of life ebbing. Liberty comes at the cost of democracy. Now that's not very wholesome. Jesus. Well, it is what it is for now. I think for now we will... In We have observed a distinct and disturbing ri rise in civilian discontentment against our government as of late. Incidents of vandalism, sabotage, and even physical confrontation with police or military personnel have been reported all across our nation. However, the most of the incidents have occurred in Sverdlovsk itself, which should probably be no cost. The most probable cause of this wave of unrest is the recent 46 Prospect Lenina incident, which led to the deaths of six and injured 10 elders. Details are spotty at best, but all reports suggest it began in the morning when a mob of civilians assembled unlawfully to listen to a speech from a political figure whose identity has yet to be determined. The local garrison responded approximately half an hour later. They announced the assembly was illegal and th ordered the mobs to disperse. The mob reportedly responded by throwing bricks. When tear gas was deployed to prevent any further violence or property damage, the attacked soldiers with we, they attacked soldiers with chains and steel pipes. The would-be riot ended when the garrison opened fire, despite having no explicit order to do so. Marshal Berkozovsky and the High Command have debated how best to respond to this tragedy. Some generals believe the soldiers involved in the incident should be arrested. Quick and public arrests are what the Republic wants and would put an end to any thought of rebellion. Plus, those men fired on civilians. Their arrest is a matter of morality. However, some other members of High Command argue that these soldiers were acting in self-defense. The rioters were the ones who instigated the violence. Arresting the soldiers would make the government look inept and severely damaged morale. In the end, Rokosovsky had the final word. They had a knife. No. Um, I'm going to wait a few days so we can get 50 political power. And we'll go ahead and do some investment into infrastructure. And then we will say justice for the fallen. Constantine, Consta Constantine, like, you may be good at what you do, but my friend, have you been wearing fucking blinders? Rokozovsky glared but told him toward him. I could say just the same. Our children's toys consist of shrapnel and wiring. Just today I saw a man mugged only inches from our headquarters. Yes, the invader has pushed Russia into senseless violence, and this will be fixed with more violence? Tell me, what separates the state-employed thugs from the regular ones? Duty, for one. How naive must one be to attack the very men who kept him from breathing. Enforcement is the only thing standing between civilization and anarchy. Armed men serving a higher purpose. You cannot reason with a bear as it charges you and simply fight or die. Petov chuckled, both in the metaphor and Rokozovsky's juvenile grandstanding. The man seemed convinced that he was a sole guardian of civilization against the ravenous hordes. Petov prepared his retort. A self-assured or grin crossing his lips. However, before he could dispense it, he froze with alarm, noticing a change. Rokozovsky had gone pale again. A terrible coughing fit gripped his body, ask shaking the general for four with its force. When it finally reached his end, Batol pressed forward a glass of water, but Rokozovsky flippantly rejected him. Old friend, perhaps it is time to discuss your health. Well, we got some new options for investment so i think as always it's always good to start with agriculture so we'll get working on that generally speaking from what i've noticed agriculture is probably the best you're working on from there probably power tools i'm starting to uh figure that out it's not a perfect system app by any mean but agriculture is definitely the perfect start. I've always gathered that much. From there, it's not the most important. So, not all hope is lost. Throughout Russia, the grief of the, Ger the Germans' cause cannot be more apparent. The former Union, shattered into pieces, cannot protect its people. The bomb is falling from the sky. All that reside below know only f panic and fear. Dreams of liberty, freedom, and plenty can do not but die. Torn by sh shrapnel and force. All the motherland from the west to the east faced a plague even more sweeping than any anger disease. Hopelessness. 
that life will go on as it had before under terror and violence. In the lands of West Siberia, however, a lone beacon of hope remains smothered in the cold and left to die in the fall of the Union, yet refusing to die. To all those who would dare challenge to challenge fate, the doors to the Marshal's army remain open. To those who hope, to those who refuse to surrender, the innocent wish for a better tomorrow, the military district shall welcome as comrades in arms in its march to an ideal future. <clears throat> the creator came to Anatoly's house again. His father, whose joints creaked along with the wind floorboards, moved to answer the call. In his darkly lit bedroom, Anatoly waited for his old man to return. The recruiter needed to understand that as much as Anatoly would have liked to fight in the front lines, his sick father needed more. He started, stared at the flame gnawing in the wick of a slowly melting candle as it burned into his eyes. But your son is of age. A firm, resolute voice echoed throughout the hallways of a small house. It faded, becoming faint blooms and reverbs, its words blurring with the evening's noise. The neighbor's dog was barking, and a mild breeze stirred the earth. <sighs> Officer, I beg your pardon. But I need him. Surely you understand? Boom and reverb. The voices moved back and forth, parrying, attacking, repo reposting. To Anatoly, it did not matter one whit. He heard the door slam closed. The impromptu reception was over. When the old man returned, Anatoly helped lift his legs and arms onto the bed, balancing his head on a ragged, pil dirty pillow. The light illuminated his father's face, and the gray hair became threads of silver under the glimmer of that faint candlelight. <sighs> Do not live the life of a soldier, Anatoly heard him say. <laughs> Do not. Do not. He drifted to the realm of sleep and snored. No other option but home. Nanjiangas defeated those guys. <sighs> so, is your father well? No. Fragments of a conversation came to him in the dark bedroom where his father slept. Tonight, too, his father had been unable to rise and attend to his duties. And only found himself beside the candle, with flames gnawing on the wick, spreading an aroma of melting lard, perfume for tormented souls. In the depth of his fatigue and exhaustion, Anatoly sat beside the bed. Anatoly did not know the nature of sickness that plagued his father. Once his old man had a healthy complexion and a slight paunch bellied the outline of his belly. Those excesses were gone. Where there was once fat, only bone remained. Where there was energy and drive, only fatigue and lethargy settled. He could not walk, and his hands regularly shook, as if alive and separate from his will. And Jolie knew that his father's time quickly approached. He stared at that gently snoring face, a visage of gentle illness. <sighs> maybe tonight, maybe tomorrow. Anatoly resigned himself to that fact. If he had been elsewhere, Finland, Sweden, or Norway, his father might have been all right. Rising from his wooden, worn stole, he made for his room, stealing a glance at his father before leaving. By the stroke of midnight, he heard the snoring cease. And so ends another life in the district. Damn, buddy, that's rough. <clears throat> Put your name and age, Baker said to the recruit, on this form, please. As a lieutenant of the district, he'd seen many men and women who signed for a tour of service. Some chose the life because of patriotic sentiments, a heroic thing to do, but some did not live up to the expectations set by their intentions. Others out of sheer pragmatism. This category of ba people Baker sympathized with. After all, Rokosovsky did not deal in shits and rubles, but bread and soup. The man who faced him, however, belonged in the same hole that Baker once did. People who had no choice but to sign up for the dirty work of operating machines that kill. The prospective recruit looked worn, rough, and shorn. Long, unkempt hair, and a four o'clock shadow slowly emerging from that chin. The man looked desperate, destitute. Thin as well. Baker could not believe that he was only 18. Gleb had recommended the des this desolate, deprived person. Father was a friend, Gleb said, and besides, he was of age. An orphan, then. The allegedly young man filled the form and showed it to Baker. Twenty, signed. Anatoly Danilovic Morozov. 
been unkempt. Twig shall be his nickname. If it were anyone else, Baker would have crossed out their old names and given them their new sobriquets. As things stood, he could not bring himself to do so. <sighs> Proceed to the medical office. If the doc says yes, I'll have you kitted out and sent to boot. An almost imperceivable nod. Just before Anatoly left him, however, Baker patted his shoulders. You're in good hands. I've been through the same thing. It's all right. <laughs> yes. Tears simmered into the sob. Thank you. Anatoly Danilovic Morozov accepted into service. That's a whole one extra manpower. Hell yeah. Let's get it. Corporal Melnikov finished up the last of his bullshit served to him, savoring every last drop of the savory soup. It was a long time since he had anything warm to eat, and he wasn't sure when the rest, when the next time he would have one would be. As he looked up, the rest of his squad seemed to be enjoying the soup, too. It's getting late. You want, them, want to stay for the night? The age Vyacheslav Yakolev asked them. Been a long time since anyone came to his cottage, so he wasn't sure if there would be room for guests, but he thought it was at least a polite thing to do. <sighs> We'd love to stay more, but I'm afraid we must continue on our mission. HQ will be very disappointed if we are late. Yakolev no noted. He was surpri surprised when Melnikov and his squad appeared outside his cottage that afternoon, but the corporal explained that they were on a classified mission from Svedlovsk that nobody must know about. So it made sense that they must make haste. As the night fell, the squad traversed the vast forest that surrounded the cottage. It was difficult to see the stars, but luckily, Melnikov had smuggled a map from the offices. As he crouched down and gazed at it, a warmth that they didn't feel since leaving the old man's house entered their faces. A short walk southwest, and they finally crossed the border over to Tiumen, to freedom. We must give incentives to stay. And that's our big thing right now to prevent this from happening again i mean if they think they're gonna find freedom and fucking human i i wish them the best there uh i don't know how well that's actually gonna turn out but good luck with that yeah good luck indeed so i want to see what we got Ooh, anti air there that would be good Industrial expertise would be good to get working on now, so we might just rush down these three once we get done with trusting the marshal. The drill instructor waited until the last bat batch of the the last of his batch of recruits. There we go. Scrawny runt named Anatoly Morozov was seen before he began. Sit up straight, dogs! Look at me right now! He shouted, his voice like thunder. Dozens of backs straightened. Some recruits jumped in their seats. He introduced himself as Sergeant Kutuzov, and also introduced the two officers flanking him as Sergeants Tereshenko and Bazin. Our mission is to train each of you to become a soldier of your military district. A soldier of a district possesses courage, bravery, competence, and integrity. He is the finest warrior in all of Russia. Am I clear? Yes, sir. A soldier of a district understands two things. One, he is Russian, and therefore his duty is to protect the Russian people. You are not here for revenge. You are not here for glory. You are here because you owe it to the millions of fellow Russians crushed under Hitler's boot. Am I clear? Yes, sir. Two, he is part of the Third Army, and therefore his loyalty is to the Third Army. You will be just as loyal to your fellow soldiers as you will be to me or Batov or Rokozovsky himself. Each and every man sitting in this room depends on you, giving it everything you've got. That, as well as your devotion to forging a new, stronger, safer Russia, is all we ask of you. Understand those two things, and I will not fail in my goal, just as you will not fail in yours. Am I clear? Yes, sir! So what do we got? Hmm, ooh. Not good either way, it seems. 
Galina Otyomova quartered her teeth as she carefully measured out the food on the counter, calculating the best way to divide the day's rations. Breathing was labored as she realized that there were 425 grams less of cabbage than she, than she thought. Why do they have to reduce the vegetable ration? She thought. No matter. She can do this. She was a soul adult in the house, so she needed the most food. No, it was the children who needed the most, but which child? She looked at the three children playing in the corner. Deniska, Katya, and Olesk. Deniska was the oldest, but was it worth letting him grow while the other children starve? No. Olesk, the youngest, needed the food the most. Galina stood there, glancing back and forth at the children at the children and the rations on the counter. She divided them and counter divided the food again and again, trying to calculate the best way to split the food before screaming and collapsing into her chair. If only Kirill were here, if she could listen to him laugh, maybe she could regain the strength to finish her work again. Just like that, as she opened her eyes, there was Katya with a package and a letter in her hand. Don't be sad, Mommy. Daddy sent us a present from the army. Katya opened the package and began to laugh. Laughed at the winds of a fate that caught her at its very minute. Laughed at the jokes that, w the joke that was her life. Laughed at the contents of a package. Rations, military issue, canned vegetables, 425 grams. So we can either recruit civilians into the militia, or say, say that we need them in factories. We're getting a boost in off authoritarian socialism either way, it seems. I think for now... I think we need them in factories most. That might be the best bet for now. Not all hope is lost. Next, defend your mother. The purpose of the military district has been clear from the very beginning. Protection, not expansion. Under Marshal Rokozovsky, it has directed and dedicated itself to the security of Russians living under its rule. In a Russia torn by genocidal violence and ideological extremism, mere ideals of milk toast reform cannot sustain the livelihoods of millions. A firm but gentle hand must guide their way to the future, shielding them from danger within and without. All who join the district shall receive a rifle, rations, and pay. These are the three means that enable a man to defend his family. Father, mother, sons, and daughter. Whether brother, sibling, sister, or stranger, one more pair of hands shall ensure that no more lives will be lost. There are dangers about, but with the people marching forward hand in hand with the district, they shall know no fear. Got a little bit of extra manpower, a little stability. It's very nice. Then we'll eventually um, get down to this. Maybe do this as well. Oh, actually, the anti air might not be too bad. As soon as available, let's get some loot. We're investing in infrastructure. We'll get this extra little boop right there. We got the fancy computing machines. Ooh. Uh oh. Okay, so the government of the Euro Military District consists of nothing but Rokozovsky's most loyal and talented comrades in arms. The same cannot be said of the rest of armed forces. Our current army is populated with conscripts who defected from the team in involuntarily. That is, they landed on the side of the border, our side of the border, when dust settled. Many still hold favorable views towards Steeman and even Kaganovic himself. Even more of pervasive and pressing issues, the uptick in reported cases of Black League propaganda being found in barracks all across the country. Foreign agents in our armed forces will not be tolerated. Treasonous or unreliable actors must be excised like the disease they are, lest they revolt and destroy our nation from inside out. So, uh, that's not good. This is certainly not good. I did not notice this, and it might be a little bit too late to do it right now. But, we know for later. And that's, I think, the most important thing. 
Private Dmitry Olegovich Chaban sighed as he looked at the letter, slumping down on the barracks bed. <sighs> They've cut the severe rations again, he said to his friend, Private Agapov. Ever get the feeling that this isn't how socialism is supposed to be like? They told us everyone would be equal. Now we're all equally starving. Of course, it's a vanguard party of workers who are supposed to lead to a revolution of victory. A bunch of generals pretending to be socialists are just military dictators under another name. And this is... Legovic, the reason why our families are starving is because the brass doesn't care about anything but their own self-gain. That's why the old Soviet Union failed, too. One of the real way forward? The real path to socialism? Shaban nodded. Anything would be better than the husk of an army pretending to be a country. Agman took out a warm pamphlet from his pocket and handed it to Chaban. The title read, Stalinism, Stalinism, the way to the future. Search him out. That's all we can do right now. Literally all we can do right now. I didn't notice we could do this, and that's not going to help much. This will increase their influence, unfortunately, but... And it is what it is. The Grand Marshal Rokosovsky, formerly of the Union, now controls what little remains of the military district. The people of Sverdlovsky rep represents a final desperate hope of stability and liberty. Burden imposed burden pose such strain on his physique as he has taken on the responsibility for millions. His soldiers, staff members, and people beg him to reconsider his task to delegate his duty and rest. He refuses, a lone man against the advancing tide of tyranny and authoritarian rule. As such, there is no other course of action than to trust the marshal to do his obligation. From all levels of society of the military district, all shall take the marshal at his word, that he is experienced and thus knows best, from the beggars and the homeless to the cities and villages to the highest echelons of command in their Spartan quarters, all will look to the marshal as a beacon of life, liberty, and happiness amid a Russia torn by war and chaos. There we go. So there will be extra influence, which is a little unfortunate. But I'm assuming once we get... <clears throat> In the heart of Sverdlovsk, a stranger walked about purpose. Thankfully, the day was overcast enough to ground the German bombers. The man had come to town the previous night to turn in a bounty on a group of bandits and taken residence in the local flop house. As he walked through the streets of Sverdlovsk, he passed by a small park. To call it a park was perhaps too generous a statement. It was just the largest patch of unblemished park lane left in the city. Still, he strolled through the area and observed those around him. On days like this, without the risk of German bombs, families could be seen enjoying a rare day of peace. To be sure, there were not many of them, but those that were there filled a stranger's heart with a strange warmth. It had been so long since he had seen such peace among any of the people of Russia. He came to stop at the top of a small hill, scare, scarred by the bombs and scorned by the people of Sverdlovsk. He sat on the lip of a small crater, looking out at the people that had passed by. Before he could get too far into reminiscing, he heard the small sneeze behind him. Turning, he saw the source. At the bottom of the crater sat a small girl no older than six. She looked up at him in shock, eyes wide. Looking around for the girl's parents, he motioned for her to come in. Come here, little one. Where are your pants? He asked, still searching. I don't know. I, I can't find them. She spoke, her voice quivering on the edge of tears. Before she could break down in hysterics, the stranger held up his hand. Come along. We will find them. The man took her hand and it brought her down the hill. They spent almost an hour searching for her parents, but in the end they found them. The two looked like they had been run ragged. Their faces were twisted in panic. The re little girl rushed from his side to her parents as they sagged in relief. Before they could thank him, he had melted into the crowd and disappeared. A simple moment of kindness. I'm guessing that's our German friend who uh, keeps going about the wastes. Oh, damn it, I should have selected the option to have Steve make it this far. Damn it. Okay, so we can go ahead and crack down on one of them. 
I think it's equally bad. So I think we'll start by cracking down the people who immediately border us. So that's going to be the revisionists. It's the toast, really. Well, move to the border. <clears throat> I swear commas are. I don't know where the pamphlets came from. Shouted Private Shaban as he sat in the interrogation room. So it didn't come anywhere, comrade. A magical fucking fiber just flew down from the sky one day and dropped it in your coat pocket? Comrade Vasilev shouted, shoving the Stalin's pamphlet in Shaban's face. I swear, I will beat the shit out of you until you die or start talking. Do you understand, comrade? I, uh... You got three seconds to remember, comrade. One. Two. It was from comrade Agapov, comrade. He gave it to me on lunch break the other day. Really? And do you know where he got it from? Uh... A couple of weeks ago, I think I saw Comrade Ivanov giving something to him. And uh, I remember Agapov was also talking to Comrade Bobrin the other day, too. Commander Vasilyev smiled. And that's it, Comrade. Keep talking. Let's purge the remaining agitators. And let it be known, we will not... Let's get these guys over. Come on. One position. Will not back down so easily. The anti aircraft gunners, sa st stationed on the hills outside Sverdlovsk, prepared their battery for action. Scouts stationed on the western side of the city had reported an incoming German bomber formation, and they intended to be ready. With their outdated equipment, the gunners knew well that they were unlikely to actually impede the bombers in any appreciable fashion or stop them from completing their mission of terror and death, but they knew equally well that they had to try. They, were, they had to strike back against the hated Germans in any way possible, and in doing so, salve the despair currently endemic to the Russian conscious. As a formidable came, came into view, large black ovioids far above, the lead gunner reigned Ranged them as best as he was able to and prepared to open fire. Just as he was about to, however, his sergeant grabbed his arm and pointed to the sky. A swarm of smaller dots had emerged from the clouds, pouncing up on the bomber formation before it had been and had a chance to concentrate itself. Every Russian in the district knew what that meant and prayed for it as much as they could, often to no avail. But this time they had been heard. The aviators had arrived. The gunners knew that they should be firing nonetheless, as the aviators were not integrated into the district's command structure, but they did not. No one dare risk hisking one of the aviators flying high above, and thought it was technically a violation of orders. They knew that their officers would overlook it, for they felt the same as the gunners themselves, and the same as any true Russian. As several of the bombers trail began trailing smoke and flame, the gunners shared a cheer. A victory, a minuscule, minuscule as it may be, had been won. The legend of the aviators continued to grow. If only they would fly for the district. Brazil's won the World Cup. And now they fucked up. The PRC has actually managed to win. Are these guys gonna. Come on. Fuck, they are actually pretty well. We've been raided. Fuck, okay. That's really not nice. Let's fortify factories. Basic fact of district's existence is clear to all. It is surrounded from all sides by organizations and factions that seek to dominate its, in its territory and people for sinister intentions. As such, it is imperative to keep the factories running lest they overrun the army and achieve their aims. However, the current weather of German bombs and shrapnel falling out of the sky has proven to be quite challenging to accomplish this feat. With decreasing out decreasing output and industrial efficiency, the factories would not be able to give this equipment to the soldiers in time, dooming the district in the process. The marshal and his staff have come up with, perhaps not the most original of ideas, but a tried and true one. Labor battalions will work together with the engineer corps to reinforce the factories by any means necessary. Camouflage them, hide them, fortify them. No method shall be beyond the reach of the district. Fuck. I guess we should... 
Constantine's side. We should have just let these guys take it from us. God damn it. Constantine sighed and let the report fall onto his desk, on top of a dozen other documents. His headache was killing them. He hauled himself to his feet. Stabs of pain ran up and down his back. He walked over to his window and leant on the sill. Dark, heavy clouds were ma massing on the horizon. Below him, citizens scurried past London Avenue. A truck carrying a handful of soldiers rumbled past. He was an old man with weird Russia and her people on his shoulders. How long did he have left? A year? Two? Five? What had he accomplished? The Union collapsed, with the Republic collapsed, and Sverdlovsk was surrounded by enemies. Babel's appointed successor was more than capable of leading, but he was no miracle man. He couldn't stop the bombings, he couldn't make more rations, he couldn't stop Kaganovic or Yazov. None of the state Sverdlovsk was in. Konstantin knew these thoughts were best left unsaid, but he had to be honest with himself. And even if he was doubt himself from time to time, the people never did. He was Konstantin Rokozovsky, after all. An old man, yes, but no, also commander of the Third Army. Hero of the Soviet Union and benevolent guardian of the last bastion of freedom in all of Russia. If anyone had the medal to reclaim Russia, it was him. A stubborn smile crept across his face. He sat down and clicked on his desk lamp. He settled his glasses higher up on his nose and looked down at the report, picking up where he left off. He couldn't give up. Not now, not ever. There is still too much work to be done. Trust in the marshal, for he trusts you. Garrison Slaughter. God damn it. Motherfucker. Fucking libtards. God damn it. Why do you have a non aggression pack with you? Hmm. Hey, have you seen Chaban? I need a cigarette. Asked Private Kunstinov to his comrade, Private Rogov. The barracks canteen seemed emptier th this afternoon. The chatter was quieter, and there seemed to be fewer feel familiar faces in the now small crowd. I think they took him the other day. <laughs> Kunstinov paused for a second at the implications at of what Rogov said. Oh. Can you maybe ask Agapov if he has a cigarette then? They took him too. It was this morning. Ivanov? Barberine? Them too. The two soldiers paused once more. The silence of the canteen was now deafening. It seemed obvious, just impossible to speak as the implications of Rogov's wards became obvious. Quincidolov tried gesturing to his comrade for a cigarette, but it seemed so trivial to the saltness around them. It was solitude that they found themselves in. Such is the price of revisionism. Well, I will use up as I will start training as many fucking divisions as I can, so that the manpower lo loss will not be too bad. And with that, it's time to end the video, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for watching. Over, if you like this video, leave a like. If not, feel free to dislike. And we'll see more of this content this year. Hit the sub button for uploads every weekday, as well as every Saturday. If you have any comments, feedback, concerns, anything of the sort, leave in the comment section below. I read all the comments I get, and I appreciate any all feedback you might have for me. If you want to chat, play games, anything of the sort, uh, check out my Discord. If you want to send it back to my every month, check out my Patreon. If you want to see me do the sort of stuff, I have, I have a Twitch, all of which are down in the description box below. That's really about it, ladies and gentlemen. Let's do Offensive Doctrine. That'll be good. And, um... Organization, I think, will be good, too. And yeah, that's it for now, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, as always, for watching. My name is... Well, my name has been Dogboat333, and I will see you guys next time. Goodbye.